here I am with Aaron John Gullius. Now, I did this with Tony Morrill, too, who I was talking to earlier today, and I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your last name right, because in Tony's case, I wasn't sure where, whether it was Morrill or it's more of a French-Canadian pronunciation, Morrill. Okay. And he tells me it's Morrill. So I'm just going to make sure that it's, is it Gullius? Gullius, yeah. Gullius, yeah. which is, now is that Hungarian? Yes, it is. Uh-huh, yes, it see? Is. So all those people who say I don't do any research before I do these shows, <laughs> <laughs> just let me tell you. And for those folks who don't know Aaron and for his work, uh, you're a historian, but you also have an interest in the world of the weird and the wacky and the paranormal. Yes, yes I do. So tell, um, us, tell us about you and um, what you're interested in and, and, and who you are. Okay, well, I, um, I guess I guess start off professionally. Um, I'm a uh, history instructor at Mott Community College in Flint, Michigan, gorgeous dystopian Flint, Michigan where I teach just about every history class we have, or I have at one point or another. Only things I don't teach are Michigan history, because I'm not from here and know nothing about it, and Holocaust, history of the Holocaust, because I just can't be that depressed for 15 weeks. That would be pretty rough. I, uh, I got my master's degree in U.S. history from Indiana, Purdue, Indiana University, Purdue University um, at Indianapolis, and my B.A. in history from, uh, from Hanover College in Hanover, Indiana. My interest in the paranormal started um, actually when I was when I was eighth grade. I read uh, Dan Cohen's book uh, on on aliens, and I was like, "This is this is cool." Dan Cohen wrote a bunch. I think it was Dan Cohen. I think that was his name. Wrote a bunch of books for kids about ghosts and and Bigfoot and UFOs and things. And I started reading that. Then when I was a senior in high school, the X Files started up. And then at college, I found the internet there in 1994, 95. Then. My uh, my advisor as an undergrad and the advisor to our history club had a great idea back in 19 this would have been 1997 for uh, the spring history club event. He decided that he was going to invite David Jacobs to come speak on campus. So I was actually part of a small group of students who had dinner with David Jacobs of late of uh, not late he's not dead of Temple University, which I think he just retired from. And so I, I met David Jacobs. Uh, he's a strange guy. Uh, so a, even even then, he was a strange guy. He gave his his uh, his pitch. Um, his book, The Threat, was was just coming out. And and now, you know, 15 years later, I'm I'm sort of kicking myself for all the all the questions I didn't ask him, like what qualifies you to hypnotize people, and and things like that, and and how did you get tenure, and and, and, <laughs> and questions like that, and uh, and and. Why does your why does your UFO controversy in America book just trash the contactees so badly and and you know just continue to you know play kissy face with Donald Kehoe? But um, I didn't think of those questions then. I was like, so what do you think the aliens want with us, Doctor Jacobs? Because I I thought it was all very cool. Then in grad school, I uh, I needed a uh, a thesis topic for my master's degree, and it was either going to be uh, pro wrestling in in the fifties. Or flying saucer belief in the 1950s, and I chose flying saucer belief because I could not figure out how to afford to get my hands on enough old pro wrestling footage to actually make any kind of argument. So, whereas UFO stuff, it was everywhere. So that was kind of a kind of a pragmatic decision. But but that was sort of broad Cold War UFO belief, everything from the contactees to to NICAP as sort of fitting into this Cold War mosaic. And uh, now I'm sort of three quarters of the way th through um, writing a book for uh, McFarland books on just the contactee movement from Adamski all the way up to uh, to the people who still today claim to be channeling Ashtar and, and all these people and sort of fitting, seeing how the contactees reflect the times they're in and also seek to um, seek to influence the times in which they live. It's, the way I, I view the contactees, and we'll probably get into this, is it's not just a one-way street. It's not like, oh my gosh, atomic bombs are frightening, so I'm going to make up Space Brothers to feel comfortable about how the world is or what the world might be like off the Earth. It's it's an active subcultural, countercultural effort to influence um, to influence people's beliefs and actions on a on a national, international scale. Now that doesn't mean it worked. And that doesn't mean it moved the needle enough to even make it into detailed histories of the Cold War. But that doesn't mean it didn't 
it didn't exist. So, so that's who I am. I'm a, uh, I'm a history teacher. I'm an educator who, who happens to um, have the luxury of being at a community college where I'm not required to do research in any area that's at all not silly sounding. So <laughs> I'm able to play with flying saucers and give conference papers about Doctor Who and things like that. Well, yeah. I mean, if your choices were I can do the Holocaust or I can do pro wrestling and UFOs. Yeah. I mean, I I chose the Holocaust. That's <laughs> that's where. And then, you know, 19th century evangelical history when I was doing my graduate degree. Oh. You went. I wish I if I had thought of that, I probably would have gone for pro wrestling back when I was in grad school. But mm-hmm. um, but UFOs and the contactees is where I would probably go now. Actually, contactees is not too far off from 19th century evangelicalism. You're quite right. I've always noticed the parallels, and that's yeah. definitely something that I, I do want to get into, especially when you talk about it as a social and cultural movement, perhaps not one that is well-known or, or took hold. But if you look at American history, or any country's history, really, but American history we'll talk about in particular, you can see, if you really dig deep, dozens, hundreds of these kinds of subcultural movements throughout American history, many of which seem very popular and important at the time, but are largely forgotten now, yes. uh, except by historians. Right. But if you look at the contactee thing, we kind of look back on it, and anybody who would remember it does so, like gr- maybe Greg Bishop kind of finds it interesting and amusing mm-hmm. and is fond of it. But there's very, very few people, I think, outside the UFO thing that would know what you're talking about. But, yes. But back then, there were an awful lot of people who knew it was a significant for a moment at least, a significant cultural movement. Yeah, and, and what, what I find interesting, distressing, I, I mentioned David Jacobs and his uh, UFO Controversy in America book, which was a um, which was a PhD dissertation in history at uh, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, he was one of the roughly 10 billion historians who came out of Wisconsin in the, uh, in the 1960s. Um, I think a third of my professors went to Wisconsin at some point. He talks about the the contactees as being an embarrassment to serious UFO research, and and people like Donald Kehoe and Richard Hall and those that crowd sort of actively trying to stifle them. Coral Lawrence, and although she was um, a little softer on them because she was she made money with the uh, she was the first to report the Antonio Vils Boas case, so she couldn't really rubbish the contactees too much, and then say, but 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 this guy was you know. So this guy had a you know, red-headed space chick go to town on him. So keep a straight face telling those two stories. But but there's this sort of, you know, the the UFO um, the UFO movement has this obsession with being seen as scientific. Yes, which, and that very much stems from the Kehoe kind of yeah. thing. And it's always struck me a bit. It's kind of like you know the 120 pound weakling who walks into a room of weightlifters. Yeah. And looks around and goes. I, I need to you know be like the weightlifter. No, I, you're totally different. Be geeky, be nerdy, be who you are. Yes. And understand what it is that you are. And that's still fascinating and interesting, but you're not the weightlifter. Exactly. I got, I got news for you. None of you have, you're not scientists. It's not the, science. The, the notion of, of reproducible evidence and, and reproducible testable hypotheses, I mean, there, there's none of it. it, it it's, it's anecdotal evidence. It, it's so much of it is anecdotal. And so much of it is poorly collected anecdotal evidence. I know you've talked about this, this oral history methodology um, mm-hmm. that just doesn't exist. Even sort of basic private investigator, you know, questioning, you know, a shady character or somebody of interest type of skills. It's so many leading questions. Um, you know, so, so what did the gray look like and what was he doing to you when you were on his spaceship? You know, questions like that, you know, you're going to get one one viewpoint how big was the ufo when you looked at it you know right things like that it's um it it's it's like a i don't mean this dis- well maybe i do mean this disrespectfully it's like it's like a, it's like a little kid playing around i assume if you have a graduate degree you must have taken a course in oral research methodology or if you didn't take a course at least you had some instruction in oral yeah. research because everybody does i certainly I took yeah. an entire course not to mention what i took in law school there is a talent there's a reason they teach that to us and Stan Friedman, who I love, but, you know, as a relative, but Stan's a nuclear physicist. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect somebody to come to me and ask me for advice on nuclear physics or um, how to build a better power plant or whatever. Conversely, Stan's not trained, was never trained as an interviewer. But 
you had him and all these other people who had no training in that kind of going out and just saying, hey, we can just wing it, right? How hard can this yeah. be? And well, okay, there's a reason why they teach it um, at graduate and PhD level courses. And you should take it seriously. And I th honestly, I think they mucked an awful lot of that research up to the point where the Roswell thing is a mess and yeah. the contamination. And they still don't see it. Probably a very small group of people, you and I are in it, that understand just how bad something like that can be when you're looking at cultural history, folklore, and, which is what we're dealing with, really. Yeah, it's it's almost like the, the topic of, of what UFOs are is too important to be left to ufologists. I think we need, you know, it's sort of a cliche, but but man, Jacques Vallée was was the perfect guy to look at this. Um, he had a broad background in in science and the humanities, and and he brought a fresh perspective, and and he went out and actually actually talked to people. I was rereading Messengers of Deception a while ago, and and he's going back and forth, going to weird cult meetings in in Berkeley, and and doing all sorts of stuff. That um, and, and he's going to cult meetings. He's not saying, well, well, that's unimportant because it's not science. So I'm gonna just look at lights in the sky and see what comes down. Um, it would be like trying to, uh, and I agree with you about valet, it, but it would be like trying to study the Catholic religion by just going to Fatima and saying, yeah. you know what, I'm just going to study this one incident, this these kids in this town and the, the reaction and all of this stuff. I'm just going to say that, and that will tell me everything I need to know, not just about Catholicism, but about religion and God and faith and spirituality, that one incident. Right. Or conversely, you could say, you know what? I'm not going to go to evangelical prayer meetings. I don't want to hear about the snake handlers in West Virginia. I don't want to hear about the Salvation Army types. I don't want to hear about anybody with experiential type of religion. Mm -hmm. I am just going to sit down and study the King James Bible and talk to the leading theologians. And that is all I need to know about religion because right. I want to be serious. I want to yep. be the weightlifter of religion. No, you got to go down to the meeting house, the congregational meeting house, and you got to go to the Black Baptist Church, and you got to go down to Africa and South America and see how they do it. Yep. And the all of it, and you can't be embarrassed by any of it. That's that's the thing. I mean, it's it's that it's that embarrassment factor because because we're worried about we um, they are worried about what what scientists will think. Well. I, I'm a historian. I don't care what scientists think. I, I think scientists don't think about this stuff really much at all. They're too busy being scientists, and, unless you're Seth Shostak or Joel Tarter, who really are more PR people than scientists these days. But it's um, – or those days, whatever happened to, to SETI. Um, but the thing is, I agree. I, I think – by it's sort of like the split between uh, between Thomas Aquinas on the one end and Hildegard of Bingen on the other. You know, you, you've got the scholasticism and you have the mysticism, and you, you sort of need them both to understand the Church in the Middle Ages. You need Kehoe on the one hand, and you need Truman Bethram or George Van Tassel, Van Tassel or Adamski or George King on the other to understand ufology in the 1950s and 60s. It's part of a spectrum of belief. And to just focus on on one aspect of the rigid orthodoxy is is not is not necessarily useful. No, absolutely, I agree. Which is why, you know, you could pick any particular decade, and you could say in the 1980s, you have to focus, yes, on the Roswell thing and Majestic 12 and everything that Stan and all these people were doing. But by the way, you also need to start focusing on the X Files and yep. dark skies and how those shows were shaping and reshaping the perceptions that the general public had not just about ufology because i don't think the general public cares about ufology but how it was changing everyone's perception about extraterrestrial life the possibility that it was coming here and then how some of that was inevitably reflecting back on how ufo researchers and lecturers and salespeople were doing their work and the filter through which they were interpreting and putting the information that they were getting. Absolutely. I mean, there, there's there's sort of a there's sort of a feedback loop between '90s paranormal media and um, the 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 paranormal research field. Um, they they influence each other, and um, I think the media recognizes that that it's influenced by you know what crazy people are saying in books or crazy sounding people are saying in books and online. But I, I think it's like you said, it's it's more difficult for the researchers to realize that that what they're doing is, is sort of picking up on these on these sort of popular memes 
and, and sort of recycling it into their books. You know, you know what? The, the whole JFK thing in Dark Skies is pretty cool. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe there's something to that. Maybe they're using Dark Skies as a conduit to release information. And, and so you, you start to, you know, pick up on the disclosure movement type stuff. It's like, oh, well, you know, maybe everything we hear is part of the truth. And if we can just look at enough of the truth, we can come up with some sort of grand unified theory. Uh, what I find interesting is in that 80s and 90s period where where you had the, the abduction stuff with, with Mac and Jacobs and Hopkins, that's the other guy, sort of sort of coming up and and you had the the sort of the dark E. T. John Lear Matrix document, you know, sort of you know, they're coming to steal our livers and, and mutilate our cattle sort of thing. What's interesting and, and what sort of sort of part of my work is, is is getting into a little bit is the fact that contacteeism persisted. You had people like uh, the woman who called herself Tuella, uh, channeling Ashtar you know, on a regular basis. You had other movements coming up. You had the exopolitics movement try to sort of hack out a middle path between the conspiracy theories and the, the sweetness and light space brothers. Contactees never went away. They just, they, they just spoke to fewer and fewer and fewer people. The Ethereum Society, George King's outfit, actually has a branch down the road from me in Royal Oak, Michigan, which I'm going to stop by and visit one of these days and, and talk to them. It's still going. The George Adamski Foundation is still going. And believe me, um, you should not use George Adamski's pictures without the Adamski Foundation's permission. They will talk to you. That, that was an interesting exchange of emails with the head of that organization. I had to convince him that, no, I'm not using these photos to debunk Adamski's flying saucers because I don't care if Adamski's flying saucers are real. That's not the point. It, it really is like, like undertaking a study of a religious group in a lot of ways. I mean, theologians don't say, well, you know what? What really happened to Paul? Let's, let's dissect this on the road to Damascus. What was the bright light that he saw? They talk about how Paul interpreted it and the long-term effects on civilization that these beliefs and his writings had. And that's kind of how I see the contactees. I don't care what happened to George Adamski in the desert. That doesn't affect my life. What affects my life and my work is what George Adamski said happened and who believed him and how that developed over time. So your book is going to be called Space Brothers on Patrol. And I noticed from your website, and I will put a link up uh, to your website, you actually have a word counter. You are 6,175 yeah. out of 85,000 words into finishing your book. Yeah, let me tell you about that. The uh, Space Brothers on Patrol title is actually a placeholder because the actual title messes up the formatting of the word counter. Um, the um, the actual title is um, Flying Saucers, Space Brothers, and Interplanetary Femme Fatales. Um, See, with, that's much better. Yeah, oh gosh, yes. With a subtitle of Extraterrestrial Contact narrative, Narratives from Space Age to New Age. Because wow. um, I've got the whole colon then explanatory subtitle very academic yeah you know that's how it goes and i'm up to about sixty-two thousand words now so i'm hope that the manuscript is due august 31st i'm hoping to have the writing done by the end of june so i can actually go and take all, out all the words that suck and put in better ones so that's my plan that probably i won't miss the deadline in august but i might miss my end of june writing deadline there's just you know, when you plan these things out, you don't know how things are going to go. So there's, you know, my, my son's starting preschool and swimming lessons and vacation, and I'm teaching two classes online, and 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 suddenly the the writing time becomes, you know, midnight, and yeah. then there's no words left. So, but um, yep, that's uh, that's where I am with it. It's um, it's interesting. I actually sent the proposal to McFarland almost on a whim, um, not on a whim, but I was, my aim was to get some feedback from an actual editor. I, I wasn't looking to, to write a book. And then they said, they came back with, with a bunch of questions and I'm like, Oh, interesting. They're asking questions. So I, I'm answering these questions about, you know, scope and, and length and, and things. And then they asked me more questions about photos and, and do I, have I identified sources for photos and photo permissions and it just goes back and forth over a couple months. And then, then suddenly they said, we would like to send you a contract. And I'm like, okay. They publish mostly uh, pop culture, uh, military history, and automotive history. Uh, they're a weird little sort of 
position between academic publishing like the university presses and and popular publishers and they have a, a strong presence at the uh, the academic conferences and libraries and I wanted to, to, to do a book with uh, the old school publishing um, paradigm before it disappears forever so um, sort of say I remember when we had editors son you know so things like that but it's it's going along pretty well as opposed to the self-publishing world that most UFO and paranormal authors sort of live in yeah yeah. Where, where there's no editing. Right. And and that's, that's... This paragraph was edited by my cat. Yeah, you know, it, and it's... You know, on the one hand, I like the idea of the of the democratization of publishing. Um, but on the other hand, you know, Theodore Sturgeon, 90% of everything is crap. So that 90% becomes bigger. Exponentially <laughs> larger, yeah. Yes. I mean, the same thing has happened in the film and television industry where you have everybody and their dog releasing a web series now. Yeah. And that's, I like you too, I've done interviews on, um, on film-related shows where they interview filmmakers, and I say, look, I'm all for it, the democratization of filmmaking. More ideas out there, fantastic. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it's like having a bigger lawn. Hey, I used to have a really small lawn in the back of my, but I knew where all the flowers were. There's one yeah. little flower bed. Now I've got... 50 acres, but I don't know where my flower bed is yeah, because the, fl the flower bed is the same size, yep. but now there's 50 acres surrounding it. Oh, no, by the way, nobody's mowing the lawn. It's just completely overrun because I went away for a year. And with 50 acres, you know, you have various coyotes and other sort of sort of creatures roaming around out there. It gets dangerous. And, and crypto terrestrials. Crypto terrestrials and, and, and oh, crypto terrestrials. I, I'm, I'm working – Mac Tony's uh, into the into the concluding chapter of the book as, as sort of a um, sort of tying everything together using him and um, comics wise actually this is pretty interesting there's a, a new comic series out from Vertigo the DC mature readers imprint by Paul Cornell who um, ha who wrote um, one of the David Tennant Doctor Who stories the one where he becomes a uh, human um, yes uh, and he, it's called uh, it's called Saucer Country. And it's about uh, a governor of New Mexico. It's only on its third issue. A uh, governor of New Mexico who's running for president. Um, she's a Hispanic woman. She's divorced. She's a feminist. It's you know she's a groundbreaking candidate, and she's pretty sure she's an alien abductee. And and so how this plays into into the political system with her advisors, and then the ongoing story of of what's really happening to her because it turns out her entire staff might be being an abducted and i uh, i talked to paul cornell on twitter and i said will the space brothers show up and he said pretty soon so i'm looking forward to that so oh, wow. i'm going to tie in uh mac and some pop culture stuff in the last chapter but i, I figured I, I couldn't write a book about this without mac appearing somewhere you know on my my personal website there isn't well there is but there's very few days so far on my blog um, that i've gone by where i don't have something called mac thoughts yeah and what I do is I just go to his either his old post human blues blog or to his website, but usually to the blog. And I'll just, you know, I mean, he had 10 years, I think, worth of writing. So every month he'd write about 150 posts. And all you have to, a lot of it was him just posting, hey, I find this interesting. And he wouldn't comment. But then there would be a lot of stuff where he would comment or he'd write original stuff. And you just pull a paragraph out and say, look, here's an original thought by Mac Tony's that within that one paragraph, you're going to have more things bounce around in your head than reading an entire book put out exactly. by most UFO writers. Or not to pick on UFO writers, but most books put out by any writer today. Yeah. Like, he, he was... you know, Stephanie Meyer or whoever writes those Twilight things. Yeah, I – yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, Twilight. Oh, God. The, twi the idea of, of Twilight – and this is way off topic, but Twilight as, as sort of this sort of loathsome youth – trilogy thing um sort of really is what put me off reading the hunger games trilogy for a long time because i figured it was just the same thing then i read the hunger games trilogy and i was like you know what this would have been pretty intense stuff when i was in you know eighth grade pretty pretty good so i'm i'm glad i'm glad i read it so consider that a, a ringing endorsement for the hunger games trilogy but yeah there's some there's some loathsome stuff out there and um and, and max ideas i i sort of have have, have sort of bookmarked a bunch of my favorites from the old post-human blues blog and i go back and read them occasionally when when just my brain is stuck and it's it's amazing how many ideas per square inch that guy could come up with not just 
new original stuff, but slightly different takes on existing things that yes. were, were just groundbreak. His his after the Martian Apocalypse book, I got it thinking, oh, oh it's going to be like Richard Hoagland, whatever. And then I read it, and it's like. This is the cleverest argument for, for extensive manned space flight I've ever seen. You know, th- this is – he's not making an argument about a face on Mars. He's making an argument about the human future. And and I, I was just in awe of the, the sort of deftness with which he did that. The title alone, After the Martian Apocalypse, awesome. Somebody should make that a movie title. Yes. Uh, made, wait, note to self. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm still working on trying to get Doing Time made so that uh, – oh, yeah. uh, you're right. It's it's it is sort of about Mars and it is kind of about the Mars anomalies and there are those things in there. But it's also you're quite right. A very it's a passionate plea to hey let's get off this planet. Let's you know become impassioned about space exploration again. Just about things outside our own planet. There were all these ideas working around in his mind. You can almost see it if you got to know him. You could almost travel back in time and go, hey, I know exactly what you were thinking when you were writing this. And then you were thinking that, and then you were thinking that. And he, you'd put it all in this goulash, with your Hungarian ancestry, Thank you. you'll appreciate yes. that, in this goulash. And most people just make the goulash. He made gourmet goulash. Yeah. Which, and the thing is, he was, you know, it, it becomes a little maudlin in some respects to talk about it, but yeah. he, he had such a bright future ahead of him that, uh, you know, we're lucky... People would criticize the crypto terrestrials, a lot of these old line UFO guys and go, this this is serious. This is Richard Shaver. And we've heard all this before. No, you haven't. Yeah. Um, you haven't heard this before. It's a different take. He's boring. He's, he's expanding on it. No, by the way, he's not telling you that this is his answer. He's right. just putting it out as a thought experiment to get people to talk and to think. Yes. And, and you know, it, it's when I read the crypto terrestrials, it, it, it's difficult because you know that's not the book that he would have come out with. It's the book that his editor was able to cobble together yes. from, from what was available. So that's, you know, authorially, that, that's that's a difficult thing. Well, Mac Tony said in the Crypto Terrestrials, and Mac Tony's editor said in the Crypto Terrestrials some things that Mac might have rewritten five times. You know, that's, but that's just the nature of, of the beast. But what what he says is he doesn't, He's not talking about the hollow earth. He's not talking about strange creatures. He's talking about us. He's talking about how humanity views itself and how humanity chooses to see what it doesn't understand. And sometimes that comes across as ways that that strange things, I'm not saying this right, there, there are strange things we see that reflect aspects of ourselves. And I think he was interested in that and i think that plays into the uh plays into the post-humanism that he was that he was so interested in how will humanity shape itself in the future because we've gotten to the point technologically where we can shape ourselves more drastically than our our environment can and that's something that hasn't happened in human history before and what is that going to look like yeah it's funny you hear people like steve bassett and the exopoliticians and a lot of people in the ufo field talk about paradigm changing yeah when we when the alien presence is revealed i hate the word paradigm but um (laughs) our paradigms will change really let me tell you something we're changing our paradigms already yeah and it doesn't take aliens to do it i was again i was talking to tony morrill earlier today and we were talking briefly about post-humanism and sort of came up would you wasn't exactly the question I asked, but you know, if you had the opportunity to basically plug your brain into a computer, Mm -hmm. would you do that? And he said, well, I would do version two. (laughs) I I wouldn't do the beta testing version. Um, you know, but I would, once they proved that it worked and it didn't fry my brain. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I tell a lot of my friends cause I'm in my mid forties and I say, look, we use these tools. We use computers, we use cell phones, we use all this stuff, but it is not of our generation. Um, in the same way that bank machines, my dad uses them, but it's not of his generation. There are things happening now. Technology is moving so fast that kids, my niece and nephews who my niece, I think is 12 or 13. My nephews are nine or 10, even younger actors that I deal with in the early twenties, it is of their generation and they will face a future. I think they are probably going to have to ask that post human question. You know, where a line starts to get drawn and you start to think, well, are we really human anymore? What does it mean to be human? So when you run across somebody like Mac 
And there are many others. Greg Bishop, for instance, this is why I like all these guys, Nick Redfern, in their own ways, they're all asking, well, what does it really mean to be human? Right. And if that means saying, well, okay, let's look at how aliens might be and compare ourselves to them, using it as a, as a prism through which to view our own selves, then that's, I'm fine with that. I think that's going to be the great question of the 21st century. What does it mean to be human? Where do we want to go from here? And I don't think the paradigm shifting is going to be from space aliens uh, from outer space. It's going to be from within ourselves. And it's not a question that we're asking as a society. Even though these changes are taking place, they're taking place and we're not really thinking about it. It's just one day you wake up and go, oh, I can plug myself into a computer. We haven't done that yet. But, oh, I, I cannot possibly go anywhere without a cell phone. Yeah. I cannot not be in communication with the universe. Well, really? Because that is a paradigm shift. It is. From and, when I was a kid. And I'm I'm one of those people who is who is constantly connected. One of the things sort of paradigm shifting that that's taking place is um is uh, augmented reality apps on phones and mm -hmm. and the Google glasses that are coming out. I mean, it, it seems like oh yeah, you, you look through your camera phone and it it tells you when the, the little icon over a business door that you're standing in front of that tells you it's hours. So what? Well, this is a completely new layer of information that we are giving people access to and creating that's that's huge that that's it's not it's more than just a sign on a door oh you can look at the door i don't need my phone to do that but it's it's on the road to these things being part of our bodies it's the sort of the the cliche of you know one of these days they're going to just glue those bluetooth earpieces onto your head and you'll be like the borg but but it's it's coming and by the time it comes I was going to say it will be too late, but that sounds that sounds kind of alarmist. But it, it'll be too late. I'm feeling kind of alarmist tonight. It's a, it's a Friday night. Let's roll with alarmism. You know, it, it's it's 2012. The world's ending. My calendar doesn't go past uh, December 31st. That's troubling to me. So I don't know if I can get a new calendar if the world ends. Um, I'm still using my 2011 calendar because it's got cute penguins on it. And, excellent. Uh, I'm looking at January 2011 right now because there's <laughs> these penguins crawling across the ice flows in, south, in the Antarctic. And it's like, oh. Oh, you know, I, I couldn't find a good 2012 penguin calendar. So, yeah. I mean, how many different devices do we need to tell us what day it is? You know, you might as well keep the calendar you like. Yeah, I just don't have the right days on it, but yeah, it I suppose I, I could scribble through and just yeah, cross just out last keep... year's days and put new days in. Or or, 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 or be like a, a, a junior high school girl and just, just, just carefully disassemble the uh, the calendar and hang the penguin pictures up all over your room. Wow, okay, yeah, I didn't like junior high school girls okay. in junior high school. So, so. Yeah, so that would not be the best option for you. No. Just, just pretend it's a Justin Bieber calendar. And... Okay, <laughs> sorry about Sorry. Creep, creepy, awkward moment there that I had <laughs> Why is Aaron thinking of junior high school girls? That's that's not good. Oh, and, the, and the apocalypse. Actually, the, the apocalypse, junior high, it's yeah. all pretty much the same thing. I can see how that would have, one would have led into the other. Yeah. Uh, I remember a girl in junior high school. She used to, she was what today you would call goth, but mm -hmm. they didn't call it that back then. And she was absolutely convinced, you know, like the who don't trust anyone over 30. And I want to die before I'm a 30. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, Hmm, I'd like to look her up when she's 30 and see whether a, she still wants to die. I, and I'd show up with like a big knife, mm -hmm. you know, and I'd go, Hey, I remember you from junior high school. You know, you wanted to die before you were 30. Well, by my count, you've got about four hours left. So, how do you feel about that? And I'd just stand there with this giant butcher knife. <laughs> and she'd be like with her three kids and her husband going, oh, no, I, I've got to go to work tomorrow. And um, and that's probably what would have happened. But there is a chance I could have shown up and they would have said, oh, she just hanged herself or something. And I go, oh, well, well you know, OK, fair game. <laughs> that's I. All right. She uh, walked the walk and talked the talk. Good for her. Well, like, th yeah. thank you for evening out the creepy factor. There. Exactly. <laughs> and then I would have said, I guess I won't be needing this butcher knife. Here you go, kid. You can, <laughs> you can just keep that. Your mom would have liked it. So I probably just edit that whole thing out. But on the other hand, this is the other side of truth. So I don't know what truth we're on the other side I, I'm of not, right now. I'm not sure, it, but uh, but it's entertaining. How do? Yes, that's what these shows are. They're just all entertaining. How do I get us back? How do I get us back? Let me think. Hold on. I'm supposed to be good at these segue type things. <laughs> Right. So Nick Lidstrom's retired from the Detroit Red Wings. Yes. And no, that's not going to get us back. I do. You know what? I'm just going to crash reboot 
Okay. I'm just going to go blue screen of death. I'm going to hit alt control delete here. Boom on the show. I'm probably going to put a Doctor Who sound effect in right now. And we're back. So here's here's um here's a question for you. You, you study the contact. Who's your favorite contactee? Ooh, and that, and why? That is a good question. Um, Occasionally I ask them. Yeah. Um, that I was I was thinking of if you ask me who's my favorite contactee is what what am I gonna say? I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to to cheat. I'm, I'm gonna have to say my favorite, and then I'm going going to have to also talk about the one that I was that I think is is one of the most one of the most significant in a way that I didn't expect. Sure. Um, favorite, um, favorite man, Truman Bethram. Truman Bethram with, with, with his, his, uh, his sexy space captain, Aura Reigns with her perky little uniform. And, uh, and the fact that like in all caps and exclamation was, it was a lady spaceship captain, you know, it was, it was just this, this great thing. And you could, you could tell that, you know, his wife didn't believe the story about the flying saucer and, and nobody, no, everybody believed him, but his wife, but Aura understood him. And, and, you know, it's just this whole psychodrama. And what's great is, is Bethram's book came out very quickly after Adamski's. And he talks about at the end of his book, uh, his, I rode, um, aboard a flying saucer. That was, that was his first book. He actually goes to Adamski and tells him a story. And Adamski says that, that's, that sounds, that sounds about right. And, and then, <laughs> then Truman's wife believes him for a while but um it's great because there's there's no spiritual stuff in it really it, it's not it's not new agey it, it's you know practical advice for for living in this strange new world you know it, it's it's very i was in the gray barker collection i got some some great letters between truman bethram and gray barker before Bethram published his book, when he was in the process, and, and he's very open about it. He writes to Gray, I got a really good ghostwriter for this book. So it's going to tell, she's going to tell my story really well because I'm not a writer. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm a mechanic. So I, I went and found a good ghostwriter to, uh, to do the writing for me. It's like, that is so refreshing. You know, <laughs> he's just like, nah, that, this isn't my thing. I'm, I'm just going to tell my story to this person. And, um, and, and it's, it, it's, he's, he's just, I don't believe him, but I want to. I I I want to believe because I, I just oh I just want to. Um, so he he's my favorite. His book was the one I had the most fun reading. Um, okay, well that's you know um, probably the reason why you would pick it as the favorite. Yeah, uh, I, I just I enjoyed his story and and, and space babes. How can you go babes, wrong with yes. space babes? Yes, and, and and the space babe who was it wasn't just like there were fifteen Venusian women. You know, it was like right. no, she had a name and a personality, and she was she was in charge of the flying saucer, which which is which is from a, a fifties perspective kind of kind of interesting and didn't really. You didn't That's... see women in positions of authority in, in most contact e-literature. They were there as, as sort of accessories. Right. Um, Not just interesting. It's it's actually – and, I mean, you can go look at Max's website because he would post these pictures, these mm -hmm. old comic books of tube women. Yeah. It was always the women in the tubes and, you yep. know, the damsel in distress and that was the – so it, it was beyond interesting. It was – Oh, okay, it wasn't 1917 revolutionary, but it was revolutionary in its own way because here you are putting a, a woman – at a, in a position of power and authority at a time when you weren't putting women watch episodes of Mad Men. It, it'll yeah. tell you all you need to know. Women were not in positions of generally of power and authority. So yeah, it was, if not revolutionary, it was paradigm it's, shattering. It's significant. It was significant. Um, and, and my, and, and sort of also significance wise, my, uh, the, the one I was the most surprised by, cause I wasn't familiar with her story. Yes. Her, is um is elizabeth clarer uh k-l-a-r-e-r -E i found her story and, and bought her book um she wrote it in the 70s but it, her the story supposedly takes place in the 1950s I, I sort of looked into her because the uh the publishers really wanted this to be more than u.s contactees they wanted some global some global stuff sure um so which i i agree with they sell books like they said we sell books all over the world so if the book talks about more than the u.s that's good and i'm like 
you know, for purposes of the argument, yes, you know, having these things make an impact outside of Los Angeles would be good. Um, <laughs> but uh, but Elizabeth Clare was uh, was South African. She was a white South African oh. in the 1950s. But she's writing her story in the 1970s. And this is one of those uh, space sort of contacty romance things where uh, the, the space captain makes love to her and she, she gets pregnant and, and they, they, you know, they raise the child on the spaceship so she never, she never sees him. But what's what's really and I was like, okay, space romance. This is going. This is this is going in the space romance chapter. Is, is where I sort of had it pegged. And then I kept seeing all these references to race and ethnicity, that and and talk of a coming race war, and um, very sort of Orientalist, exotic portrayals of um, of the Zulu people in South Africa that 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 she who were like the servants at her farm. And and the uh, the talk of you know the alien said she was a good mate because she had golden hair and, and you know all the all this racial stuff and you know I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm I'm sort of rereading up on uh, on on just the the growing violence in South Africa in the 1970s and, and her references to you know you know a, a coming war the end is coming and it, she never mentions the Soviets she never mentions the Americans. She's writing about South Africa in the 70s right? Um, through this, this vision of, of this space romance in the 1950s. She has, she, has, she has a husband who disappears after the second chapter. We never find out what happens to him, you know, because, you know, spaceman uh, Akon, just like the just like the hip hop guy from the roots, Akon, spelled the same way and everything is uh, with with her now. So it's that was the biggest surprise. And I, I think the, the one that I thought would be uh, I can probably get, you know, a page or two out of Elizabeth Clare. It's like she might get her own chapter. It's it's pretty it's pretty interesting stuff. See, now I'm no expert on the contactees, but I know enough to say that I know something. Hanging out with Greg Bishop, yes, I could sit in his living room, drink beer, and by osmosis, if both of us were perfectly quiet, just some of his contactee knowledge would seep over into my brain. Yes. So, I've never heard of her. I'm sure Greg probably has, although I don't know whether he has or not either. How did you kind of run into into her? You know, I it, it was it was one of these uh, one of these serendipitous things. I was looking at another woman who's a contactee who claimed to have been made pregnant by a spaceman. She was in England because I was like trying to find references to European contactees when I was initially doing the research uh, six months ago or so. And um, this one, it was just like a little news story. I think it was up in Birmingham or something, um, or Birmingham, where she was uh, she was impregnated by an alien. But uh, the person who summarized this on their website said the story is very similar to that as uh, that of um, South African Elizabeth Clare. And I saw, and I saw that, I was like, hmm? I, I Googled her, and lo and behold, her biography from 1970, her autobiography, uh, autobiography from 1979, had just been republished a couple years ago, and was available for uh, paltry twelve dollars on Amazon. So, um, so I got that, and it had a postscript by her son, who is not not the alien son, but her Earth son, who is now, gosh, probably in his well, he was he was a teenager in the 50s, so. An older guy. And it's like a postscript from a Christian perspective, and um, and he he basically says, I don't think I have no evidence that my mom, you know, met a spaceman, but I have no evidence that my mom's ever been a liar. So something happened to my mom. I don't understand it, but she believed it. And I thought that's that's nice, you know, that's that's sort of a, a nice a nice. But and then he sort of you know sort of criticized some of the new agey aspects of some of the things the aliens told her from a, from a more, um, from a more sort of, sort of dogmatic, uh, Christian perspective. But, but it was just the, this sort of like, I don't have any reason to believe my mom, but she's my mom, you know? Well, it's a kind of a long and winding road, which is how research is done. Sometimes you find these, you're looking for one thing and you stumble across something else. I would just say, and you might find this interesting, as you might know from if you've read any of my stuff over the last year or two, I have an interest in synchronicities. Yeah. So as you were, as I asked that question, I was, and you began your answer, I clicked onto your 
website. Now, I could have asked that question at any time, and I was going to click onto your I Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers website at some yeah. point, but I chose that moment to, okay, I'll click onto that from your other, your historian yeah. page. First thing that comes up as you start talking about Birmingham is um, Space Nick, Demons, your post on Redford. Nick Redfern. Yeah. Redfern, of course, is from Birmingham. Yeah. And then, of course, this lady's son has the Christianity connection that you were uh, talking about. And there it is. I'm looking right at it as you were saying that. I was just kind of post particularly millennial fundamentalist Christianity as you were saying it. I'm just thinking, hmm, I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Uh, you know, people that would listen to this that have criticized me for being obsessed by synchronicities. I just, when these things pop up, it happened to me and Walter when we did Radio Mysterioso. We had this long run of them. Uh, a year ago, but just little things like this, like, okay, what are the odds that I would ask that question at the same time as I do this? And he would be from you know, Birmingham and all this stuff. Interesting. That is interesting because I'm not entirely sure it was Birmingham, but for some reason, Birmingham came into my head. You know, it, it's, now you're blowing my mind, man. I know. It, it's, you know, the, the thing is, I'm laughing when I say that too, because there's probably people right now going, is Kimball really losing it? You know? well, it's, yeah, he said Birmingham. But, you know, the, these coincidences are, are, are the fabric of reality sort of showing at the seams sometimes. Sometimes we notice the connections that usually we just sort of take for granted, which is, oh gosh, that sounds really weird. But um, Well, see, but here, as you said, it sounds really weird. I scroll down and on October 21st, you have a, a sticky note, a picture of a sticky note posted. We ignore up. the well, weird at our peril. Exactly. Yes. Just I, as you said weird, <laughs> I scroll down without knowing that was the next post, and I'm looking at weird as the word weird came out of your mouth. And I, oh gosh, and I, I forgot that post was there. Okay, this is... This and you is, know what it says under the post? You wrote two words. Remember this. Remember this. And you just said you forgot. Like, I, oh my God, I'm in Walter Bosley world right now. <laughs> this is, Walter, if you're listening, and I'm interviewing Walter tomorrow afternoon. Ah, so clearly, some of the Walter zone is already seeping into my. Um, I think, my, I think universe. the Walter zone will will someday sort of subsume all of us. I, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> it probably will, which is what he probably means by the Empire of the Wheel. It's his yes. wheel and his empire. So you know, the, the great thing about um, the the not the great thing well, I don't know if it's the great thing or not about Walter, but I first in. I, I first encountered the existence of Walter Bosley when I was a couple, gosh, four years ago, I was combing through the Radio Mysterioso archives, and there's this this weird sort of rambling show with Greg and Walter and uh, and Ralph Kuhn, where, where Walter, who I'd never heard of, he's just, oh, he's a friend of the host who showed up to talk about, you know, this cave in the Grand Canyon and, and these weird glasses that looked through time and, and you know, alien or weird beings living below the earth. And I'm like, this guy makes a lot of sense to me. You know, the, the, I mean, compared <laughs> to some of these, his, his sort of, he talked about Roswell a little bit about the idea that it was perhaps uh, an attempt to go to the moon, uh, a moonshot test that had gone wrong and or something like that. And I was like, that makes more sense than any other Roswell explanation I've heard. So yeah, it was it a fairly was, low bar, but yeah, still. Yeah, but um, but still, it. it I mean, it's like I, high jumping for cats. Yes, and and you know, students sometimes ask me about Roswell because they come to my office and I have a four foot inflatable gray standing in the corner of my office. So students' kids come in and they they punch it and it, it amuses me, but. But, you know, students will ask me about Roswell and, and I'll I'll tell them about, you know, Nick Redfern's body snatchers in the desert thing and, and some of the, the more prosaic things. And 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 they'll be like, but but wasn't it wasn't it aliens? And I was like, what's an alien? You know, define that, you know, and, and how would we know if an alien is an alien? How do we know this technology is beyond beyond our our reach? You know, it's 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 like nothing that earthlings could produce. Well, how do you know? Are you in every factory everywhere where every government person is putting together the new the new thing? We don't know. So, yeah, that usually blows their minds. Then I have to get back to, you know, the Cold War defense infrastructure and things like that. I used to have a five foot tall blow up doll in my office, which led to entirely different conversations. <laughs> um, and nothing to do with aliens, although perhaps a space alien babe, if I had painted her green. Anyway, um, I digress. This is um, there's the other side of another truth. Yeah. So you're not just a historian, though, and you're not just a guy who takes an academic interest in all of this. 
you, if you read your blog, which is called I Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers, and you post at it far too infrequently. I know, I know. You've got, I did you draw this picture in the notebook of space demons with the... Yeah. Yeah, that's... I'm that's, definitely, I'm going to put that up on my uh, posting for the show, because I think that's really the little sort of stick figure drawing. Folks will know it when they see it, it's it's really fun. But to, let's talk a bit, let's move beyond the contactees for a moment. I do want to come back and, and ask you one or two other questions, but let's move to some more general or some other areas of the UFO thing, specifically Space Demons and Nick's book, Final Events, and the Collins Leap, because you posted about it. And um, tell me what you thought of Nick's book. Tell, tell me what you thought of the idea that there is this group within the United States government, which sounds far more impressive than it actually is. <laughs> but there's the, at least there's these people who are in government service yeah. that take the idea of Space Demons, so to speak, seriously. Um, what do you think of all that? I I think I think it is plausible. I, I, I think it's it's very plausible. Um, and, and the idea of, of a government group. I am employed by a by a publicly funded educational institution which receives federal funds. So if a couple of my colleagues and I got together and decided to do something, we would technically be a government group. You know, it, it's it's a pretty broad kind of uh kind of description but um you've heard it here first folks that's right aaron gullius space demon spy i'm part of a government group um nice i think that the uh i did work for the state of indiana for a year that was depressing um (laughs) but um i think regardless of what the quote collins elite may be and there's there's some um there's some question of whether or not that's actually a real name or just yes. a name that's been applied to them. I think the idea that there are some fundamentalists, on the, the evangelical Protestant fundamentalist end of the far on the end of the spectrum, that uh, that believe these things is is absolutely true. Going back to the 1970s, there's been this intertwining of um, of you know the brief reference to the Nephilim in Genesis 6 uh, before the flood to um, to aliens and abductions and things like that. And so you combine that with the notion of, of, of an eschatology that almost demands some sort of global conflict and demands the presence of a supernatural antichrist to deceive the elect or to attempt to deceive the elect, uh, Calvinism confuses me. I'm not entirely sure who the elect is. Um, but Neither are the Calvinists. No, but. they aren't. Um, but I make my students read parts of Calvin just because I had to. So It's also a good way of understanding capitalism. It is. It is. Some people just have it. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it's, it fits in. I, I think it's – my question isn't whether or not there is a group of, of influential – of, of influential evangelicals who believe this kind of millennialist eschatology that involves evil infiltrating aliens. I, it, it sounds weird, but I, I have no trouble believing that people believe that at all. Of course not. The Republican Party's on television every day. So it, it's 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 deeply troubling what has happened to to my party of of good old Jack Kemp, and sweet good natured Richard Nixon. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, yeah, I actually have a friend who uses this his uh, Twitter profile picture, Richard Nixon. He nice. um, he thinks he's the greatest president of all time. So. Uh, no, um, but, but um, that's what I tell him. Yeah, and um, he does it slightly tongue in cheek, but yeah. It's, I, I think I think there's there's more good there than some people think, but uh, the bad was really bad. But yes. but I've I've no trouble believing believing any of that at all. My question is, and what I have not seen enough evidence of to convince me, is that these people have some sort of major influential policy role. And, and that, you know, the, the sort of conspiracy theories that, that A. Collins elite or something like it is, is actively pushing the formation of policy. I, I don't I, – I see more evidence for much more, uh, much more prosaic reasons for our policies, foreign policy-wise. I agree and disagree. I think the idea of a Collins elite, whoever Nick was profiling, um, talking about space aliens and UFOs and people being terribly interested in that. No, I, I don't believe uh, that that's the case. I do believe that the, the this small group of people did exist, but I don't believe they were influential in any way. Having said that, 
I also think that if you look at some of the things within American, the American body politic, and if you look at the long view of American politics, these movements have come and gone and come and gone again. You talk about the 19th century notion of dispensationalism, mm -hmm. which is what I studied. And you look at things like the United States Air Force Academy, you know, oh, God. indoctrinating yeah. its students yeah. in Christian theology and in essence telling them we're going to write, fight a holy war. You know, this is some sort of modern crusade. And even the language you were getting from George Bush um, and some of his cabinet ministers, even the language you still get from people in the Obama administration yes. is very troubling. And it's all part of this broader social movement. So Nick's book, weirdly enough, fits right in there. But it fits over in a teeny tiny infinitesimal little corner. Yeah. But like many things that fit in those teeny tiny infinitesimal little corners, if you pay attention to them, they they illustrate a broader picture. For instance, the dust bunny in the corner of my room illustrates that my apartment is filthy <laughs> in general. But, you know, the dust bunny itself is not determinative of whether or not I'm a slob. Uh, so but it's a clue. Yes. That's, I think that's what Nick's book is. It's a dust bunny. It's I, a I, clue. I think it's a it's a useful piece of a very, very large puzzle. And I, I think I think final events um, is is. Hmm. I think it's. I like it. I uh, I I enjoyed bits of it. I think it's important. I, I think I think it's important because this is the sort of research into what's going on with extraterrestrial belief systems that, or belief systems regarding the extraterrestrial that will actually impact us. And I, I do concede your your example about the Air Force Academy. There was some some weird stuff going on there for a while. And possibly still is. I don't know. Air Force people are going to – Walter's going to come after me now. Um, he's an Air Force guy. But um, I, uh, I, I, I think that, that Final Events is, is possibly a more, a more important direction to go in than some directions that, that other paranormal researchers have gone into. Because I like I like looking at the connection between you know like guys like L.A. Marzulli and Russ Dizdar that I mention and Bob Larson's book which um, is is horrible uh, it was a you know typical 1997 Heaven's Gate cash in sort of thing UFOs but, in the alien agenda yeah for, Bob Larson is actually a, a radio uh, a radio exorcist now he sort of rode the wave of um, satanic cult panic in the 80s. And then, uh, then transitioned into exorcisms. And in early in the 21st century, he he started uh, a series of churches, um, almost like franchising churches, which, um, as as an old school Lutheran, is, is just sort of like, ugh. but um, <laughs> it's, it's just he's an interesting guy. He was actually on um, on uh, on Art Bell once back in. 2004 something like that and art playing tapes of exorcisms that is at his um i don't want to call them shows but at, at his at his shows and uh and it was it was hilarious art, ha art art had no idea what to do with this stuff uh, i was like wow wow um <laughs> just sort of that art bell can you believe this folks uh type of type of attitude but um the reason I know so much about Bob Larson is is I, I listened to him on my commute every day for two years when I was working in Indianapolis. So um, I, apparently he did an exorcism on one of the singers from Color Me Bad. If oh you remember my. Color Me Bad from back in the 90s. I certainly do. Yeah. yeah. It was Actually, bad. Their, their name was, yeah, you know, fairly – it was one of those well-named bands. <laughs> it, it was. It was, except for Bad having two Ds. Um, yeah, that was just overkill. Yeah, I, I disliked that. It's yeah. interesting though in your post on um, on uh, sorry saucer demons space demons, yeah. you write at the end, uh, and I'm going to quote because I'm not smart enough to actually come up with original material, so I just quote other people's <laughs> materials. So here's you know my segment Aaron's thoughts. You write regardless of one's views on religion or on specific religions, the connections between the spiritual and the paranormal are there. It's just awkward and difficult to look at it for any length of time. Like the intersection of the paranormal and academia, any conclusions one draws tend to alienate at least 50% of the audience. But then you're right, maybe, just maybe, it's time for that to change. And I agree, it's absolutely time for that to change. I think we get back to that thing we were talking about earlier about the embarrassment factor, yeah. that these nuts and bolts flying saucer guys are embarrassed by, they so want to be accepted by science. Mm -hmm that they're embarrassed by anything that smacks of religion, spirituality, new ageism, whatever tag you want to put yeah. on it. And so they've run screaming away from it and they 
almost like the Spanish Inquisition. If you happen to find that other stuff interesting, you know, they show up <laughs> with the, the train of inquisitors right. and say, okay, this town is now under the inquisitions. We're going to, you, Tony's, you, Redfern, you, Bishop, we're going to, we're going to go at you. And I just think, wow, guys, you're missing like 95% of the picture here. Yeah. Yeah, because we have a lot of people who've had experiences that are numinous, that are at least as, in quotes, real as um, as people who've experienced, who've done transcendental meditation, people who've experienced various kinds of spiritual ecstasies, people who've spoken in tongues. It, it's, I mean, there's a lot more of that than there are pieces of flying saucers that we have to scientifically examine at a metallurgy lab. You know, there, there's just a lot more of it. So why not focus our attention where there's actual things? It's, it's hard, and it's not what, not how the the UFO research community wants to view itself, and and more importantly, wants to be viewed by the outside world. Here's a question for you: Why didn't contacteeism catch on? And let me explain the question for a sec, just by going back to the religious thing. Let me pick on the Mormons, and by pick on, I mean let me just use them as an example. Mm-hmm. Mormonism could easily have died a death and become just a footnote in 19th century history at any time. There are sort of many different places where it could have stopped dead in its tracks. Right. But here it is now, a, a significant part of the American religious spectrum to the point where one of its members is running for president, has a 50-50 shot of getting the job. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem to be really a problem. So that one took hold, managed to survive, and last. Contacteeism didn't. It didn't move beyond its its boundaries within sort of the UFO subculture. It might have had a couple of years of broader cultural acceptance or at least interest, but it never you know, no. never moved beyond the giant rock conventions and the few thousand people. <laughs> so so why do you think that contacteeism didn't take off to the point where we might now be thinking, hmm, in 50 years we might have somebody running as a contactee who's a, you know running for president? The reason is, I think, it's because the contactees were by and large liars. And they were not just liars, they were spectacularly bad liars. And their lies were their lies and their frauds and their their falsified credentials and their weird photographs of hubcaps were not just exposed in the flying saucer press. They were exposed in major newspapers and news magazines of the time, whereas the nuts and bolts flying saucer crowd could go to the public and say, hey, you know. We're honest. We're we're just we're just looking for answers, and the thing and, and so the public was just like, why should we pay attention to to frauds? Well, because the frauds are more interesting, and the frauds the frauds were such spectacularly bad liars because at least I argue they there's different layers. Yes, they were trying to sell books and, and sell seats to their to their lectures, but they were also making serious points about atomic weapons testing and about racism and about the economy and about international relations and about spirituality. And they dressed it up with flying saucers because you know what happens if you start talking about the need to disarm in 1952 in the United States? You're a communist. You you, know, you, you wind up in front of the House Select Committee on American Activities or exactly. something. Exactly. And, and so and, – and you – and on a more practical level, you don't get work. You, you don't get a job. You don't have a way to feed your family. And and so they, they dress up ideas that, especially in the case of a guy like George Adamski, in the case of George Hunt Williamson, in the case of of George King um, with his yoga, I, spiritual and political ideas that they had had since the 1930s and 40s that they had been pushing in various venues. It, it's... It's, it's interesting, and I, I don't want to interrupt, but I have a tendency to forget things that I find interesting <laughs> if I don't. So it's just something you said that, that touches me. If you compare the two, let's compare Keo and his group, NICAP, those folks, to the contactees. Keo and his group, um, Keo was military, but mm-hmm. there were members of NICAP who had uh, military connections, who were in the military, who had intelligence community connections. Yep. Very serious. They would show up on you know the major talk shows and be interviewed by... Um, you know, somebody like Mike Wallace and, right. and, you know, shirt and tie and terribly serious. And, oh, here's what's going on. Mm, yes, there is a cover up. The government isn't telling us everything. But you know what? The government's good. They're, it's not evil. Yeah. Um, the system, we believe in the system. I fought for the system. We're normal people. We just want to find out what the truth is about this this abnormal thing. Yes. But they fit within the mold. Yes. And yet the contactees, 
if I'm in the government in the 50s, I'm looking at them and going, these people aren't just nuts. We need to discredit these people because what they're talking about is not, oh, what are these flying saucers? They're talking about reordering society. They're talking, yep. this sounds strangely like socialism to me or <laughs> pacifism. That guy sounds like Eugene Debs when he's talking about space aliens. Yep. And the message here, this this is dangerous. So, yes, there were obviously liars and frauds within the contact team movement. But I can also understand why the intelligence agencies and the government would have had a vested interest in portraying all of them as disreputable, dishonest, and trying to, quote, quote, debunk them as much as possible, because from a social perspective, they were dangerous. Absolutely. A absolutely they were. And, and, and the thing is that the government didn't have to do much. They discredited themselves fairly well. And, and that's why when you say, say, oh, the, the contactees were, were scammers and hucksters, well, they were terrible at it. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's no evidence that anybody really got rich being a contactee. You know, well, they look at all the books they sold. Vast majority of these books were published by vanity presses. You know, they maybe made their money back. And, and you know, it's there's if you're dishonest and you're a cheat, there are better ways to use your dishonesty to make money than by making up easily disprovable flying saucer claims and hoaxing photos and going on lecture tours. So do you think they were all dishonest? Let's let's stipulate, say, that Adamski mm. was dishonest and um, the major leading ones, the published ones, were dishonest. But do you think that there might have been a group in that age or any other? I mean, because we have these paranormal experiences yeah. you can read throughout human history. People have these strange experiences. Do you think that when these people popped up in the 1950s in a technological age, there were people out there who were having genuine experiences in the same way that they might have had them in 1810 and filtered them through, you know, hey, the preacher yeah. tells me it's this. Yeah. And they these people latched on to these dishonest hucksters and found their message compelling, but also had a genuine experience that they couldn't explain and said, well, we're in the rocket age. This guy makes more sense than the preacher down the road. Is there I, that element within contacteeism? Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure I would use the, the I, I said they were liars. Uh, I, they were they presented themselves in a less than honest way, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't have that they didn't have experiences that were, you know, that doesn't mean they didn't breach that liminal space. Uh, uh, but between for the, the sake of argument, I think we can stipulate. Let's just let's just say that the major ones like Adamski yeah. were liars, but they the thousands of people that would go to Giant Rock or who would attend yeah. lectures or whatever. Sort of what I'm asking is, were they all liars or do you think there is within the, the signal to noise kind of cliche, is there a signal within the contact team movement that sort of the nuts and bolts guys have lost because they've just focused on the noise? Oh, that's a that's a difficult question. I ask those on occasion, too. Yeah, I get the impression that some of the lesser ones, so some of the lesser well-known ones might have experienced something that there might have been something at the core of what they of what they experienced um there's one pair of women um helen and betty mitchell who um you know ran into uh some venusians in a uh, coffee shop in st louis back in i think 1956 and they told their story at a few ufo meetings and at one of them somebody wrote it down and gray barker published it because gray barker published everything and now it's out of copyright and it's on the web. So, haha. -ha. But um, <laughs> it's it's so just unassuming and straightforward. We went out behind the barn and that's where their flying saucer was parked. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's guileless. It's like Marty McFly in Back yeah, to the Future. Hey, I'm just going to park it by the sign and cover it, it with trees. Yeah, it, it's it's almost too naive to be a calculated lie. I don't know what some of these people experienced. But like the abductees, I'm convinced that some of them experienced something. But we don't know currently how to get to what that was, and, and we never will now that you know, most of the contactees are, are are no longer with us, no no longer on this plane. Although Adamski was reincarnated as a member of the Venusian ruling council, I have recently found. So. Right. I did, I did have the pleasure of meeting, um, quote, quote, Reverend Bob Short, Oh, uh, wow. who was a very was a very minor figure back at the time, but uh, when I was at the RetroCon at the um, 
out in Landers, California. So I got to go to Giant Rock. I've been there a couple oh, of times. Oh, man. But got to go inside the Integratron. In fact, they did the oh. – um, whatever you think about the contactees and all this stuff, they, they, the Integratron is a really amazing structure. It is. It, Engineering-wise, it's, it's ama- it is fascinating. The acoustics, like sound engineers would love it. Because they had the, um, you would play the glass, you know, people sit there and they have glass bowls in front of them and they play in the, woo, you know, kind of new agey <laughs> sounds. But with inside the, and so we're all lying on these mats and, you know, close your eyes and try and commune to nature and stuff. And at first I thought, well, this is daft. What am I doing here? But then I thought, you know what, let's just roll with this. Let's have some fun. And I was the last person to leave. I'm not saying I communed with any you know, alien spirits, but I just thought, right. this is really peaceful. I mean, I was having a stressful day. This is nice. I'm just going to stay in here for a while, folks. <laughs> um, so, there, you know, the content, and I can see why they would go out to Giant Rock, too, because it's out, Greg loves that, that the desert and everything. Yeah. It's out in the middle of nowhere. It's this giant rock, and it is, as long as there are no dirt bikers buzzing about, it's really peaceful. Coming from a coastal community like I do, I go out on the rocks at Peggy's Cove and I can sit there for an hour or two or three and just kind of think and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. that's the same sort of thing that I think you know the contactees were doing at these uh, at these movements. So anyway, I met Reverend Bob Short and he was a fascinating guy and he was a lot of fun to talk to and he did some sacred prayer to open the whole thing where it was some kind of Native American meets New Age meets Star Trek prayer or whatever yeah. it was. And I thought, yeah, this is probably all kind of hokum, but he seems to believe it and he seems sincere. And if he is lying, he's a, you know, he's a good-natured liar and I I can live with that cuz he's not trying to sell me anything. Yeah. Yeah, one guy I wish I wish I could have met before he died was uh, Frank Stranges. Who was uh, I? You know, he he sort of shows up um, back in the 1950s, a cover story in UFO Digest. Preacher, what about the flying saucers? Which uh, is it's just a completely different sort of religious take on it than the current, you know, sort of Collins Elite style thing. But you know, he met Valiant Thor, a Venusian at the right. Pentagon, and there's supposedly a photo of a Valiant Thor who showed up at a at one of Howard Menger's things. So, you know, it's he is it, the goofiest story ever, you know, Stranger at the Pentagon. You know, it's a it's a it's a great book. It's I think the first contact ebook I ever read because Tim Beckley kept publishing it a lot. Uh, and so like, I think every high school library had a copy of Stranger at the Pentagon for some reason. But I or that either that or my, my high school really needed a different librarian. But um, <laughs> <laughs> found some strange stuff in there. Little but, from column A, little from yeah. column B. Now, what do you think all this says about our society and our culture, comparing, say, the 1950s contactees, even into the 60s, with our more modern X-Files beyond view, which is to say, back then, yes, atomic weapons, and they were afraid of the end of the world, but they said, look, we can't have these things because there's such a bright future ahead of us. We have to survive and embrace it yeah. and move forward. Now, and that's one kind of religion, that's even one kind of Christian religion. Mm-hmm. Now we have a different kind of space religion, Christian religion, all melding together, which says things are dark, things are bad, the end is coming, and you know we need nuclear weapons to make sure we're on the winning side of the end. Right. The, and heck, let's start it. The so, end has to work out the way a sovereign God has decreed it to work out, and thus we have to make conscious decisions to make God's will come true. And and, and that's that's where I sort of go off the rails with that sort of stuff but yeah it, it, that i think i think that's a that's a good observation the 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 but what the, does it say about us or it, not you and me because we're clearly rational insane people oh absolutely but, but what does it say about the general culture that we're living in i mean these I, it's I scary it, isn't it it does and I, I i think it says that some people are are living with with very little hope people are living with with very little optimism for the future clearly and and I, I think people are looking for a way out that for a way out that, that vindicates them from anything bad happening. Prophecy has decreed this to be the way things are going to be. So if this is the way things are going to be, why bother? It removes Which, the necessity to take a moral stand yeah. and to take sort of, you know, responsibility for your actions because right. you can always just say, well, you know, this is the way God has ordained it. Who am I to question God? Right. I mean, and it, it, it goes goes back to Calvin. But, uh, you Doesn't know... Does not everything. Well, thankfully not. But... Um, <laughs> I explained capitalism once. I was teaching a class of undergraduates when I was doing my um, graduate work and uh, I was trying to explain to them the difference between Calvinism and uh, free will, which is, uh-huh. you know, the predominant theological... 
Christian bent of the last really 200 years or so. And I said, well, look, here's what you need to know about Calvinism. And I said, here's the class. There's 50 students in here. All right, you two go sit over there. The rest of you move your desks over there. Okay, now you 48 are going to hell and there's nothing you can do about it. You two, you're going to heaven because I've decided you're going to heaven. And uh, frankly, there's nothing you can do about it. Right. And they go, well, that seems unfair. And I said, yes, that's Calvinism. And by the way, that's where capitalism comes from. And they go, what? And I'd say, well, of course, you wouldn't know who those two are, would you? Well, no, I, I guess not. Everybody would think they're one of them. Right. So the way they came up with it is clearly the ones that God favored are the ones that are going to have more of everything because he's shown he's showing his yep. favor to them. So let's work hard and let's try and accumulate as much as we can. And if we have the big house in the hill and the white picket fence and the eight kids and the 20 cars or horses or whatever you'd have, well, you're one of the elect because God has favored you. And they're like, wow, these were first year, you know, yeah. 18 year olds. They went, really? And I said, yes, they're probably on the streets of Montreal protesting now. <laughs> so I'm responsible for that. Good but, job. But it's just like that's Calvinism in a nutshell and that's capitalism in a nutshell. What are we going to do for the next 50 minutes? I, I don't know. But, um, yeah, you look at that whole Calvinist thing and you go, oh, and, I, you know, it's like vampires. You'd think we'd stuck the stake through that crazy idea. And now I'm going to get in trouble. But it is. It's crazy. <laughs> I'm not a fan of predestination. And, yeah. um, you know, no, we haven't. It's back. It's back with a vengeance. And that that's scary and disturbing to me. It, it is. One, one thing, you know. Speaking of teaching Calvin, it sort of ties into your your question a ways back about what kind of – what does it say about us? Is in, in a Calvinist world of, of the elect and the reprobate, the, the, the role of the church as an institution is fundamentally different. Yes. And you know the, the role of the church is to basically make life tolerable for the, the you know, 4% or whatever who are, who are the elect. And it doesn't really matter what the reprobate think about that because they're reprobate. And that's, you know, a different mission, I guess, for the church. And and I think that, you know, what we believe, what the, the society believes and, and the majority of the people of society believe, whether or not they acknowledge they believe it or, or actively believe it, it, it does affect how our institutions are shaped. And so when we have an overwhelming belief or at least a a, a belief in some way that we have to move events in certain parts of the world along to come to the right conclusion and it's 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 literally going to be hell on earth that shapes our institutions that that shapes our policy it might not shape them in massive ways there's not going to be an executive order saying you know and and now we shall you know send troops to the the field of armageddon but it's it's going to be in in little ways in little comments and little things like what happened at the air force academy those things those things shape the culture and the culture shapes society and society shapes institutions rather than institutions shaping people although that's a, you know an argument for another time getting away from religion and politics and back because you probably have to although it's later for me than it is for you you it probably is, want to go to bed or whatever it is i, that, I had an early start but uh oh, so did i wow so we're both running on fumes which yeah. might explain where this conversation has gone pretty much yes it's fun what are your views on the UFO phenomenon, leaving aside the contactees or the exopolitics or the nuts and bolts, but just the phenomenon itself? Do you think there's something there? Do you think there's something paranormal there? I think there is something there that is so weird we don't have the words to describe what is there. I, th I think that whatever the UFO phenomenon is, is so strange that we have to come up with stories and narratives to try to explain it. Just like our ancestors came up with stories and narratives to explain things that our science explains, but their knowledge couldn't. Um, right. I don't know what they are. Some of them might be visitors from elsewhere. Some of them might be time travelers. Some of it might be interdimensional phenomenon we don't yet understand. We don't know what it is, which is a really good reason to keep looking at it until we can find out more. Um, not a reason to give up and say, what are you going to do? Let me throw this one by you, because here are two historians. What if we're living in the Matrix? I'm just going to run some weird Mac Tony's like ideas. We're going to have a brief. This, ladies and gentlemen, cue the source music, which I'll edit in later. Cue the source music. We're now going to have what I like to call a radio mysterioso moment. The angels are coming for you. But listen, your life could depend on this. Don't blink. Don't even blink. Blink and you're dead. They are fast, faster than you could believe. Don't turn your back. Don't look away and don't. Blink. Good luck.
so we're back and th- in this segment it's going to be like radio mysterioso where a couple of guys in this case aaron and i just speculate on something that we know absolutely nothing about yes, but, we, but we want to talk about it so the matrix reality what about the idea that we are living in a simulated reality uh, it kind of gets to what Mac used to talk about, Nick Bostrom's theories and, and that kind of thing. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the idea that someday we can imagine creating a an artificial reality and programming it so that there would be people within that reality who would think they were real. Okay, yeah. Well, if we can imagine doing that, then the odds are that it's already been done <laughs> and that we're yeah. those people. Oh, I, you know... I, Part of me thinks that that would be a, a, that's a really cool thing to think about. Um, you know, I, my you know freshman college philosophizing with people around. What if we're all just characters in somebody else's dream? You know, that that sort of that it's, sort of thing. I and mean, this exactly. is sort of, sort of the the technological side of it. I you remember think, this is the radio mysterioso moment. So yeah, I, I think that part of me thinks that if that were the case then the storyline would have to make a little bit more sense than it does that we're all living out because you know the technological ability to make somebody think they're in a different reality is, is probably much closer than the level of of sort of programming needed to make the to make an artificial world as random and chaotic and occasionally nonsensical but more often wonderful and beautiful and amazing than it is. Of course, I might have been programmed to say that. Well, it so, gets back to the idea in The Matrix, where in the first one, which is the only good one of the three right, films, yes. but is an amazing science fiction film and a great deconstruction of modern society, mm-hmm. you've got Agent Smith saying to um, Morpheus, we created a different world first. It was perfect. Everyone was happy. And you all went insane because yeah. you couldn't understand living in a world like that. So we actually had to recreate the one you originally came from, which was horrible and had all this sort of random evil and everything in it because you could not process sort of a perfect world where everyone was happy. We would have given that to you, but eh, you know, didn't work out. Yeah. I I think it's possible. I I don't think it is, but I think neither do I. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. This has been our radio Mysterioso (laughs) moment. Cue the source music. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Well, let's wind up here with just a couple of short snappers, as we used to say in Reach for the Top, which is a reference only listeners in Canada are going to understand. It's a high school quiz game show that oh, okay. I, I used to be a whiz kid at, um, which is me bragging. But yes. Know, capital of Go Burkina ahead. Faso, Ouagadougou. I was a, a state finalist in the National Geography Bee in 1990, so go ahead and brag. And you're married. Yes. Somehow you found a woman who agreed to marry you. Despite you sound the like fact my that father. You, um, <laughs> that's right. Son, you're weird. But, yeah, so like, keep her. Yes, that, exactly. And um, yes, she's a, she's a saint. Okay, short snappers. Short snappers. Contactees again. You've t- said who your favorite contactee is. You said who your most interesting, I guess, contactee, or the one who you hadn't expected to be as interesting as, as you found them. Right. Who do you think? If somebody said to you, who, who's the one contactee I need to read about in order to understand the contactees? Sort of the leader of the movement. Who, would you, who do you think was the most important contactee? Most obvious answer ever, but it's got to be Adamski. Sure. I, I mean, there's, there's just no way around it. Just no way. Uh, you know, keep me up till about three in the morning and I could start making a case for George Van Tassel just because of not just Giant Rock, but honestly, channeling Ashtar and the whole Ashtar command thing that emerged from Van Tassel's channelings um, that is, is still sort of going on in some circles. So for longevity, there's that. George King's Aetherius Society was basically the first UFO flying saucer religion. It's still going. Yeah, their but, headquarters is a couple of miles from Greg's house in yeah, Los Angeles. Yeah, down in L.A. Yeah, it's... Yep. it's um, I uh, had a very nice, uh, very nice email conversation with a, a fellow named Oscar down there about some photo permissions. Uh, for there's an awesome book cover I've just got to show people. So okay, George Adamski. Uh, I like the Van. I'm not staying up until three in the morning, but I like the Van Tassel <laughs> thing because for me, Adamski is the obvious choice, of course. Mm-hmm. But in terms of broader, longer-lasting, deeper influence, 
think you can make a very good case for Van Tassel and that what he was doing, some of his practices, some of his things permeated throughout the broader culture yeah. in ways that we don't even really realize, but they're still with us. I think Van Tassel is is a more a more a clearer link between the theosophical and spiritualist traditions that most of the contactees were familiar with and the later flying saucer channeling. He's that sort of that sort of missing link. Adamski dropped some dropped some knowledge about the Great White Brotherhood and the, the Venusian masters, but he was very sort of opposed to the the psychic contact stuff. He he was kind of leery of that. And, and so he never really went full bore spiritualist like uh, somebody like uh, like King or especially King or um, or Van Tassel did. Who would you count sort of the sort of a short snapper that I ask a lot of people? Who would you count as influences today? Who do you look to today within the flying saucer community, if you will, oh. as people who are doing inter? We already know Mac would have yeah. been, was and and would have been continued to be one of them. But who else do you sort of find interesting? Um, I say? Uh, Greg Bishop. I, I have his giant excluded middle anthology, uh, the uh, wake up down there, just just the, the broad range of topics that uh, that that he covers on on his show and in, in the magazine was 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 really good. Apart from those two, uh, Nick, Nick Redfern is I'm sort of hitting all the, the sort of obvious ones uh, for people like us, but uh, Nick Redfern just for his his prolificness, just sort of jealous and in awe of the of just amount of words he pumps out it's pretty impressive but other than that actual you know ufo research field guys i you know it unless i'm missing somebody brand new who's come along in the last dozen years or so i don't really see anybody saying anything new last question yeah. john keel what do you make of John Keel? Are you a fan of his work? Are you a fan of his writings? Do you find him an interesting person? Because people like Greg cite Keel as an influence. Yeah. Where do you stand in the Keel thing? Because he's I, a pretty divisive figure. He is. I I like John Keel. I, I think uh, I think John Keel was 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 great in 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 the sense that he he wasn't afraid to have just outlandish ideas outlandish in the context of of ufo research and, and he just had strange ideas i found some article in some magazine or newsletter back in the 70s are space aliens holding the earth to ransom and like what the hell is this and i read it and it's like this this little clever little little just brief piece of writing that um that it's like well maybe you know these these space people are doing this or doing that or maybe they're not even space people he, he he had notions. He didn't have dogmatic beliefs. And, you know, you can't really blame him for sort of shifting things to sort to sell books because he was a professional writer. That's what that's what he, he was a professional writer who, who wrote about paranormal stuff. So, of course, he wanted he wanted to sell books rather than sell a particular view, viewpoint and keep selling the same book over and over again. I think Operation Trojan Horse and um, books like that were incredible. Uh, Mothman Prophecies is is just one of the best paranormal books I've ever read. That one and um, Mothman Prophecies and uh, Gray Barker's they knew too much about flying saucers. Just for just sit down fun read sort of you feel like you're part of this weird story rather than it being a collection of of names and dates and 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 sort of you know UFO reporting hotline descriptions of things. It, it's it, Kill stuff is well written, full of good ideas. Whether or not he believed anything he wrote, who knows? But but who cares? Yeah, exactly. at the end of the day, is it fun to read? And yeah, it brings us back to the Mac Tony's thing, but also Greg and Nick. You know, does Nick? And he's been a great pains to say, I I don't believe flying saucers are demons. And, you know, personally, but I write about it and I like interviewing these people and talking to them and following that story. Yeah. And if you want to read about my own experiences, read, you know, Memoirs of a Monster Hunter or Three Men Seeking Monsters, both of which are really good books. So I can under, I see now I already knew, but I think whoever's listening to this can see why you fit into that cabal tradition mm -hmm. that, um, you know, there's a create like th they hate me when I say that all three of them. Nick, Mac, and, and Greg, they're always like, no, there's no cabal, there's no child, there's not a group. People have actually criticized us. They've gone, you think you're better than us, you've created this group. And they're all like, no, it's just Kimball. He created it. 
he's the huckster of the four of us. We're, you know, like the three of us are all serious and, you know, it's like Kimball's a huckster. That's what he does. And I go, yeah, that's what I do. That's, I'm marketing. You guys yeah. are ideas. I'm marketing. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the journalism is, is at least partially, partially entertainment. But, Absolutely. But when, but if you're stuck in, in a, sorry for the word paradigm of science as as the only thing that really matters in this this topic you're, you're going to be sort of offended by by that or, or think that that people like like you know redfern and, and bishop and and tony's with their their sort of open-minded sort of skeptical curious skeptic open-minded skeptic type of view is 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 offensive but there's just as many hucksters in the nuts and bolts area as there are in the the other areas so Let's I, all be hucksters together. I'm just sorry I don't get paid to be a huckster. If only I could it, actually figure out a way to turn my hucksterism into dirty, filthy. Non-profit lucre. hucksterism really <laughs> non-profit. isn't really isn't even even a thing. So <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. I think that's the title of the episode. Then it's going to be um, Aaron John Gullius non-profit hucksterism non-profit and the contact e movement. Tonight is perhaps a clash <laughs> that, that's between all, that's, that's either that, more either spiritualistic that the, the aspects of UFOs, UFOs the contactees, and that sort of thing, and the more nuts and bolts aspects of UFOs and the serious people. And somewhere in the middle, perhaps even an excluded middle, we find people like Greg Bishop and Mac Tonys and Nick Redfern and Aaron John Gullius on the other side of truth. Mm-hmm.